Hi, I'm Richard Mitchamore. I'm a professor at the University of California, Davis, and I'm the director of the Genome Center. And what we're going to discuss today is our rapid ramp up, ramp up of high throughput testing for COVID and our ongoing deployment of uh, genotyping for analysis of variants. This has been a, a massive effort. I'm just a spokesman for many people, uh, some of whom are listed here. But our goal has been to provide rapid and inexpensive high throughput testing uh, and for variants of concern using technology that has been re robust technology that's routinely deployed in the ag biotech sector. Now, much of our philosophy on this has been based on the fact that what we need is cheap, rapid turnaround testing. Uh, adapted from Michael Mina at Harvard, this curve, you can see that the infectious period varies uh, five, six days or so. And if you were to test at the, when someone's symptomatic, and it takes you five or seven days to get the test results back, that person's no longer infectious. And so much of the early testing really was uh, inconsequential. What you need to be able to do is to catch people at the front end and uh, isolate and do contact tracing. So then you can focus your resources on the infectious individuals with low CT values. So I knew that the ag biotech sector had technology that would enable high throughput testing. The ag biotech sector regu regularly, the large companies will generate millions of data points a day. The uh, middle machine you see in there, in the middle, the Nexar, is an endpoint high throughput PCR machine. Uh, we though went with the IntelliCube, which is the qPCR platform you see in the left there. And uh, this is uh, actually in the ag biotech sector, it's not really even regarded as ultra high throughput, it's just medium throughput. And the way that both these machines achieve this is that you see on the right hand side, you've got the tape and it has uh, sets of SIM68 micro wells on a tape. And these machines will set up the reaction and the case of the IntelliCube will run the qPCR action on the machine. It's very hands off. So you can basically set up sequentially many, many, many uh, reactions. In the early stages of our deployment, we discussed with uh, ag biotech folks, particularly at Corteva, and they were very helpful. And I think there were a number of takeaways that we took from those discussions, one of which is you need fast, actionable data in real time. Don't sample more than you need. You know, each assay is only a very, very small amount. You need robust and technology that's tolerant to sample heterogeneity. You need to minimize the number of handling steps and you need to get in the microplate format as soon as possible. And in order to minimize the expense, use small reaction volumes. And so this is where our workflow was developed around these principles. It was a very fast ramp up. We got the green light from the administration in early August and they actually told us they wanted to start testing six weeks later. Uh, we actually were running reactions. It took us another two or three weeks to get the regulatory environment, uh, the regulatory paperwork straightened out. Uh, running, the, Getting the technology set up was more, uh, was easier than getting all the regulations which kept on changing during the time they were, we were deploying this technology. So initially, we uh, screened about a thousand students as they came onto campus the first week, two and a half times that the next week, four and a half thousand the third week. And now we've expanded to all students, back to staff, and uh, they have to get tested at least weekly if they're going to come onto campus. And we've also since expanded to the city of Davis through the Healthy Davis Together initiative. Now, this is a very sort of holistic approach of which we are only a small part, but an important one. So the city, anyone that lives or works in Davis can get free testing and they're encouraged to come in every week. Uh, <clears throat> um, the way that this works is that uh, you make an appointment, you get a QR code, 
uh, to your phone. This ID is checked at the kiosk. The QR code is then linked to a barcode on the sample tube that you're given. There's absolutely no identification, well, there's no PHI information that comes to the testing lab. Uh, symptomatics, this for asymptomatics, symptomatics are sampled elsewhere. And there's a YouTube limp link if you want to see more about how this works. Now, one of the questions we had is how do we deploy the sampling? And there's some cons consideration of whether to go to sort of at-home uh, or collection kits. I think this is much more efficient because you don't have to make up the kits, you don't have to break them down. Uh, we've got one very large collection kiosk, which is a full of basketball courts, um, 38 spinning stations, work seven days a week, eight hour days. We have a capacity of about 32,000 samples a week. And we've got another one of these replicated, slightly smaller, for Healthy Davis Together. It takes less than four minutes to get through the whole system. Uh, and we have a very high level of compliance in the, uh, the student body and the faculty and staff. We are a pop-up lab uh, in the Genome Center. We're an extension of the CLEAR certified uh, student health lab. Uh, and obviously we have uh, MDs in charge at the top. One of the other important points here is you've got to have redundancy if you're running a high throughput workflow. And you, we, therefore, we've got two IntelliCubes that you see there. <clears throat> there are a wide variety of parameters we had to explore and optimize. I'm not going to go through all of this. Please take a screenshot and uh, we can discuss them offline later if you want to go through them. But there was a, a large amount of uh, parameters that we explored. One of the things was, though, because the IntelliCube uh, allows you to do 768 wells of arrays in one and a half hours, we could rapidly explore a broad experimental space with replication to optimize the various parameters. So the workflow we ended up with is here you've got your tube <clears throat> barcoded. It goes into a 96 well rack in the collection kiosk. Uh, then we heat and activate it uh, to devitalize it. And one of the keys to handling saliva is the saliva direct, it's, we directly use raw saliva. As anyone that's worked with saliva knows that uh, you get a lot of viscosity issues. Uh, Lutz Frenica, who's the manager of the DNA core, came up with a great idea of using papain. As you know, when you eat papaya, you can feel that your lips tingle. That's because the papain is a, uh, an aggressive protease that is doing a number on your saliva. So incubating with papain really gets rid of the um, gets, gets rid of all the viscosity. Of course, you need to heat and activate that; otherwise, it'll chew up your PCR reagent. Then we semi-automate the uh, decapping and, and um, transfer to uh, 384 well plates. We can take the 384 well plates and put it on the IntelliCube, and then the IntelliCube does everything else. It sets up the reactions and runs them. The results are exported to the cloud, where we use the Eugen Text Fast Finder plugin to do the QC and reporting. This has a pretty rapid turnaround time, so we can run 768 reactions in one and a half hours. So that's 6,000 reactions per machine in a 12-hour day. Everyone asks, you know, what's the sensitivity? Well, we use the FDA-approved primers and probes. We look for N1 and N2. It's actually a superplex reaction now. So we put them both together with the same fluorochrome. Uh, and the, using the, uh, the FDA uh, definition for the sensitivity, well, we're down to about 12 to 15 copies per microliter of saliva. That's six copies in the actual reaction. So this is similar to sensitivity with some tests with EUAs with MP12. It's not ultra sensitive, but it's certainly sensitive enough to pick up uh, any infectious individuals. In terms of uh, correlation, we uh, uh, were able to get raw saliva from uh, Arizona State. They're very good to give us a range of samples with different CQs. And they were actually screening for ORF, AB, S, and N. 
And you can see there is actually a fantastic correlation of the CT values between our test for N1 and N2 and the three viral targets that were um, previously determined in the ASU. We've developed, a, the campus developed a good website. You can go to this web thing. If you just type in Campus Ready Davis, it'll give you all the details uh, and, and uh, the, ongoing, the ongoing record of how many positives, et cetera, we've got. We have a very rapid turnaround time. Uh, we're reporting back about 33% of the results get back the same day. 59% uh, the next day. So in total, that's over 90% are reported by the end of the next day of sampling. This has resulted in rapid isolation of infected individuals and quarantine in close contacts. So going forward, you know, it's important to emphasize that frequent testing is only part of the mitigation strategy. Now, testing doesn't solve the problem. It just tells you how much of a problem you have. So wearing masks, and limiting personal contacts are absolutely critical. And this is the message that we, we propagate out. We're doing sort of 4,000 to 5,000 a day regularly. We could probably do 8,000 a day fairly easily. Uh, though, you know, the throughput's large, but it's not infinite. We're expanding now. We're offering testing to all the school systems in Yolo County. Uh, we, we help out with assisted living facilities as well as doing the city of Davidsville and all the campus. Now, we're always aware of alternative technologies, but in terms of cost-benefit ratio, even the rapid antigen tests, we're going to be very comfortable in price. And so we're then moving really on to uh, monitoring for new strains. Just to sort of consider a wrap-up of this section, you know, what's rate limiting? The kiosk, the sample collection, these are large, this is not rate limiting. The qPCR machine is not limiting. Many workflows, it's the analytical component that's, that's rate limiting. It is not. Where we are limited at the moment is the accessioning step. Even though it's uh, RNA extraction free, uh, it's a very simple workflow. Still, just moving uh, thousands of tubes through the lab a day, this is what's rate limiting. I would like to point out that this has been a massive team effort from all across campus. You know, we've got 60 staff uh, and 75 students working in the kiosk. We've got three teams, two production and one development in the testing lab. We've got a data management team. We've had terrific support from LGC uh, and Eugen Tech. And then never underestimate the importance of having a, uh, a great administration behind you all sorts of aspects of the administrative components on campus really got behind this and made it happen. So moving on to surveillance. There's a lot of noise in the press right now about uh, viral variants. The viral evolution is inevitable. Most of the sequence variation occurring can be unconsequential, but a few uh, changes increase fitness. And this is what we're seeing. You have effectively an infinite population size continually generating mutations and testing, pinging the human population. Selection initially right now has been for increased transmissibility, and that's what we see in several strains. As we roll out vaccines, you're putting a steep selection pressure to render the vaccines less effective. Increased virulence is probably inevitable and some predict vaccines will be ineffective within 12 months. What we need to do is try and minimize the boom bust cycle of vaccines being deployed, the virus evolving to overcome them. We're currently doing, really what we're doing is only practice for when a variant appears that's not controlled by vaccines. We need to sort of prepare for that eventuality. Now, of the new strains that are here, there's the B117, the originally identified in the UK, B1531, the uh, originally identified in South Africa, and P1 was originally identified in Brazil or travels from Brazil and Japan. There are more, more infectious, probably because of uh, mutations in the 
binding site to ACE2. The data that's coming out says the vaccines, at least uh, they are effective, in, most of them are effective in reducing the uh, severe illness and death. What we don't really know so much about is how well um, the, how many of those vaccinated individuals will be asymptomatic. Uh, you know, we, we monitor for variations in the N1 and N2 binding sites and probes, and so far there haven't been any variants that will compromise the N1 and N2 assay. So we're, we'll now talk about um, how we're deploying. Oh, yeah, so there is evidence, though, that some of the uh, vaccines, uh, some, some of the variants, have reduced or a complete escape from neutralizing antibodies, and this particularly the South African uh, originating strain. In terms of the US, the epidemiology, these strains are here. Uh, you, you can see that they are proliferating. Uh, the CDC recently said that the B117 is uh, now the predominant strain in many parts of the US. And you can see that the other ones are beginning to come in. And just recently, the so-called double mutant from India hasn't been officially declared uh, a variant of concern of interest yet. But it certainly has mutations that are in common with some of these other high transmissible, highly transmissible strains. And it's the strain that's proliferating in India. So what are we doing about it? Well, these mutants have, variants have characteristic mutations often predominantly in the S protein. You can see the N501Y that's common to the three major variants of concern at the moment in the interface between the, the ACE2 receptor and the spike protein. So we can design assays to detect these mutations. Now, a lot of it's being done by sequencing. The problem with sequencing is it's expensive, it's slow, and you're generating a lot of redundant information. So you've got to think, why are we using a particular technology? Now, sequencing is extremely important for identifying new variants. However, once you've identified variants, the, the value, the, the novel information content you get from a sequence decreases asymptotically as the number of sequences goes up. And therefore, it's much better to screen for the discriminatory SNPs. It allows you to get through much higher numbers. You get a real sort of picture of, of what variants you have. So I've summarized here. We, what we're doing is we're deploying uh, genotyping technology. And actually, the uh, IntelliCube and the Nexar were originally designed for detecting SNPs. So it makes perfect sense to deploy these machines in this context. You can get high throughput, the reagent cost is lower. Anything that's PCRable, you can run through these assays. The technical complexity is way lower. And the turnaround, importantly, is much faster. However, the resolution is relatively low compared with sequencing. And certainly, you're not going to discover de novo SNP mutations. Furthermore, at the end of the day, it's much easier to interpret the data you get off a genotyping platform than a sequencing one. So the assay that we're working with, developing collaboration with the LGC, uh, it's, a, it's a probe competition experiment. You have probes that are uh, not fluorescent because they're tagged with a probe, but they also have a quencher. And until they hybridize to a template, and then the uh, TAC polymerase goes through and its exonuclease activity cleaves the probe, releasing the fluorochrome from the, from the quench, uh, you then get a signal. So it's a competition of the match and mismatch that you get uh, will give you your signal. And uh, anyone that's familiar with this field will see that we've got the, the, the uh, usual, the usual uh, uh, sites that we're going after. And this pattern then allows you to discriminate between variants of concern uh, and different variants of interest. 
Here's an example of QPCR trace for the H69 V70 deletion. You clearly see in blue, you've got the wild type clustering nicely here. And then you've got in red, uh, five variants clearly have a different trace ratio of FAM to CFO fluorochrome. There's actually two types of samples loaded on this gel. One was raw saliva and the other was the residual on a uh, nasal swab and therefore they were in the uh, VTM. You can see they have a different baseline, but still we get a perfectly good signal out of that sample. Here's a summary of endpoint results we got for eight genotype, uh, genotyping assays. You can see there's very nice uh, discrimination in blue, you've got uh, uh, the FAM, which is wild type, and the CFO is detecting the variant in red. Uh, <clears throat> for example, in the top right panel there, you can see that uh, the L452R variant, a uh, characteristic of uh, the Cal what's so-called California variant, you know, more than 50% of this particular sample was, was of the California variant. So to give an overview, uh, SNP assays for variants of, of, of SARS-CoV-2, they're high throughput, they're rapid, they're inexpensive. Uh, we're not the only show in town. Multiple SNP assays uh, from, uh, are being developed. Anything's PCRable, you can run them on. Uh, there's no need for RNA extraction, which keeps the price down and speeds things up. So if it is that you do extract RNA in your primary test, sure, you can run that and it gives very good results. It can be run on a PCR machine. And the endpoint assays may actually be sufficient so that it's, it's low tech. Anyone with a PCR machine and a fluorescent plate reader could uh, be analyzing for variants. It allows monitoring for much larger numbers of samples and sequencing. Uh, all samples up to a CQ of about 30 will give us a good signal. And that's about the same threshold of sequencing. And the information can be generated in, in real time, so you allow us infinite uh, interventions. It does not replace the need for sequencing. It's complementary. It relies on sequencing to identify new variants of interest. And also, it doesn't compete with the supply chain for sequencing. Now, a, a big challenge is it's not a, a FDA authorized at the moment. And so we need to change the uh, regulatory landscape to fully exploit this technology. So ongoing what we're doing, we have a variety of inputs. We test both asymptomatic and symptomatic positives. Uh, all positives are genotyped at about 14 loci, though some of them are redundant, we're cutting that down. We can get informative data within a few days of sample collection. And so all non wild type samples a sequence validated. And the sequencing takes about a week later. Two examples here. You know, you've got the reference pattern above, and then we've got two actual samples. And you can see the pattern. Uh, one matched uh, B117. The other one was a potential B1351. Uh, originally collected, two days later, we have the genotyping done. And then it takes another week or so before the sequence validation. So we were knowing within just a few days of sample collection that uh, we had a variant. So in terms of relation to uh, surveillance and uh, vaccination, one of the challenges we're now facing is that people after vaccination are saying, I don't need to be tested anymore. And this is a message that we need to try and counter. It's extremely important that people after vaccination continue to get tested. Uh, you know, we know even with the with the um, the wild type, the non variants, you get 60, uh, 40 to sixty percent of infections are asymptomatic. And the efficacy data for vaccines is how many people get symptoms, not how many people are, are actually infected. There's very little data on how frequently, va frequently vaccinated individuals become infected and whether they're infectious to others. The CDC a couple of days ago 
just uh, report, reported that 6,000 individuals have been infected in the US after vaccination. So it's critically important to monitor the variants that reduce protection of vaccines. And you know, almost inevitably, uh, we're going to get virulent variants that compromise the effectiveness of vaccines. And without testing, we're not going to pick that up. So, so taking the global view, it's extremely important that uh, surveillance is done on a global level. You can't build walls and keep out the virus. Uh, so unless we roll out both vaccination and testing on a global scale, we're going to continually going to have problems. And sequencing just is not feasible in many countries, while the relatively low-tech genotyping is. So it's complementary, and we'll still need to sequence from uh, around the world, but we don't need to do it in the same intensity that is currently being proposed in the, in the US and Europe. A big effort needs to be made for regulatory acceptance, for public health actions, and then ultimately we're going to have to get pub, uh, FDA approval for genotyping it by clear labs for patient interventions so that when a strain uh, that, <clears throat> that is more virulent uh, it causes greater pathology comes along, we've got to be able to genotype it in real time. Sequencing is just way too slow. And right now, we don't have that in place. So wrapping it up, uh, we have a genotyping and sequencing team, uh, a lot of efforts going on, and I'd like particularly also to highlight uh, the design team, Lindy McLennan and Tanya Nolan at LGC. They've done a great job of designing the assays to give them to us. We uh, test them and put them into production, and it's been a, a, a great win-win collaboration to develop these assays. And with that, I will finish.